Um, I'm going to, as the oldest member of the committee, I'm going to convene this meeting and I want to welcome you to the first meeting of the Finance Committee in the fifth session of the Scottish Parliament. Um, agenda one, item one, is the declaration of interests. And with members' permission, I'm going to go round the table for declarations. You will have read the paper that was circulated in terms of declarations. Um, and if I may start off, um, I am a part-time member of staff at Glasgow University in the role of Professor of Scottish Culture and Governance. I earn approximately £17,000 a year for that. I have an office provided by the university in five Lilybank Gardens, and I just point out the address because it's next to the Fiscal Commission, and in fact is adjoined by a corridor with the Fiscal Commission, just in case people pick that up. I am a writer and commentator. I've written seven books from which I still receive meagre royalties, um, and I do uh, occasional work, a consultancy work for a range of bodies, including a not-for-profit global charity of conservation called SIARC, uh, which does um, uh, data processing of monuments throughout the world. I think those are the relevant interests that I have. Um, I'll ask the uh, ask Alec Johnson to... Thank you very much. Uh, I believe that uh, I have no relevant interests, but I will draw members' attention to the entry in my register of interests where it declares my ownership of property. Okay. Kate Forbes. I think that the only relevant potential interest is that I'm currently in negotiations to be entered into membership of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of England and Wales. Mary Fraser. Thank you, Convener. I've got three interests to declare. Firstly, I'm a member of the Law Society of Scotland, although I'm not currently holding a practising certificate. Secondly, I have an interest in two uh, residential properties uh, as landlord, which are currently rented out, and I'm therefore in receipt of rental income. And thirdly, like yourself, I'm a published author and am in receipt of uh, meagre royalties and occasional payments for appearant, appearance at book festivals. Patrick Harvey? I don't think I have any uh, interests I'm required to declare. Okay. James Kelly? Uh, for the record, can I declare that my brother Tony Kelly is a sheriff within the sheriffdom of Glasgow and Strathkelvin? Okay. Ivan? Uh, yeah, can I declare that I um, own a house um, in Stirling Local Authority area that I rent out and I also own 50% of a company that re uh, lets out residential property. I'm a director of the Commonwealth and Renumerated, um, a director of a, a, a trustee of a charity, um, Education International, provides uh, education in rural Bangladesh and Renumerated. Um, and I was a director of a number of manufacturing and consultancy businesses, but those were uh, directorships so I resigned prior to being elected to the Parliament. Professor Tompkins. Um, thank you, Mr. Tompkins, in the Parliament. Um, uh, um, I, but I am, a, I am, I do, I, I have three relevant uh, interests. I think uh, um, uh, well, the first is that I hold the John Miller um, Chair of Public Law at the University of Glasgow, um, uh, where I am in receipt of uh, remuneration for services as an employee of the university. Um, I uh, um, uh, have uh, irregular um, uh, income through uh, conferences and I am the published author of more books than I can remember about constitutional law mainly and I have some royalty income from that. Thank you. Neil Baby. I understand I have no relevant interest to declare. Willie Coffey. Thank you. I have no relevant interest to declare other than what's declared in my voluntary section of the declaration. And for the record, convener, these are that I was a former local councillor in East Ayrshire Council. I own a very small number of shares in Kilmarnock Football Club uh, and I serve on that club's community engagement board. And I used to be an employee of Learning and Teaching Scotland, which is now known as Education Scotland. Thank you. Ash Denham. No relevant interest to declare. Thank you very much indeed. Um, the agenda item two is the choice of convener and the selection of uh, the convener uh, requires a member to be nominated by at least one other member of the committee. The Parliament has agreed that only members of the Scottish National Party are eligible for nomination as convener of the committee. That being the case, I seek nominations for the position of convener. Nominate yourself, Michael Russell, to be convener of the Finance Committee for this session. Are there any other nominations? Uh, as one nomination has been received, I therefore ask the committee to agree. Mr Kelly. Uh, um, I do have a point to raise in relation to your nomination. I think uh, we probably should proceed with the process because unless you wish to object to the process or do you wish to make a, an observation about it? Uh, I wish to object to the process. You object to the process. Please, object. Um, 
My objection is on the basis I believe that you've got a conflict of interest. As you declared um, in the previous section of the agenda, you hold a professor position at Glasgow University for, for which you're remunerated uh, to the sum of £17,000. Uh, as this committee will be considering matters of finance, including the budget and allocations of that budget to universities, uh, I believe you, that you've got a, a conflict of interest and that you've got a, a paid interest from uh, a university that's got an interest in the budget process uh, and therefore uh, I think there's an issue with your nomination. Okay, um, there isn't anything in the standing orders about objecting to this, so this becomes a matter, in my view, of an election or otherwise. So uh, if you wish to object to this, I would suggest that I put this to the vote and that you vote as you wish. Would that be acceptable to the committee? Uh, is that an acceptable practice? Yeah, I mean, y y yes. I mean, did, I mean, do 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 they want? To, to, does the member wish to to push it to the vote? That's the, that would be the issue. Uh, yeah, I do wish to push it to the okay. vote because I because I believe that the matters that I've raised uh, are relevant. Mm -hmm. Okay, in that case, I, I'm going to put this to a vote of the committee, uh, and the committee can either vote for the nomination received. Or a vote against. Okay. Okay. Um, as one nomination has been received, I therefore ask the committee to agree that I be chosen as convener of the Finance Committee. Firstly, are we all agreed? Okay. In that case, we will go to a vote. Those in favour of the nomination, please show. Can the clerks count this, please? Those against? Please show. The, it is therefore agreed nine votes to two. Um, the, I then need to move to the, and thank you for a, the election and for, for the nomination and for the election. Um, agenda, uh, agenda item three has the choice of a deputy convener. The selection of deputy convener requires a member to be nominated again by at least one member of the committee. Uh, the uh, Parliament has agreed that the members of the only members of the Scottish Conservative and Unionist Party are eligible to be chosen as deputy convener. That being the case, can I invite nominations for the position of deputy convener? Murray Fraser. Thank you. May I nominate Alex Johnson? Okay. Alex Johnson has been nominated. Are there other nominations? Again, the same procedure applies. If there is any objection, then we will take a vote on this. Um, one nomination has been received. And therefore, I'm asking the committee to agree that Alec Johnson be chosen as Deputy Convener of the Finance Committee. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Alec Johnson, I should have asked you willing to be. Uh, indeed. Good. Okay. <laughs> well, there we are. It's fortunate. Otherwise, we have to start again. Um, the next item is to agree to take business in private. Uh, agenda, this agenda item four relates to a contingent liability issue which the Scottish Government have requested that the committee consider before the summer recess. Such issues have been dealt with regularly in private in the terms set out in the written agreement between the committee and the government, as they often relate to Scottish Government contracts which involve third parties. Uh, it is, of course, open to members to object to items being taken in private if they so wish, but can I ask members whether they are agreed to consider Agenda Item 7 in private? Agreed. Anybody contrary-minded? No. Good. Um, agenda Item 5 relates to the appointment of a budget advisor. Um, you'll have read the paper, the committee has traditionally appointed advisor to assist the committee in its scrutiny of the Scottish Government budget. I should perhaps start this by saying that I think there's a, a question in some people's minds as to whether a single advisor at this stage of the process uh, can actually uh, do the job that we're requesting. And I think we should discuss what that job is. This is not a part of our discussion about who would do this job, that will come at the next meeting when we look at nominations that we're, we've been seeking. But the work of the committee, as we'll come on to when we discuss the work programme, is uh, likely to be complex. It will, for the first time, consider substantial matters of taxation. Um, and it will also consider the normal scrutiny of the budget, which is a complex process. Um, I should make the point that the committee will not consider matters of the Constitution at this stage because the standing orders of the committee, the standing orders have not yet been changed to give the committee that responsibility. That will only happen in September, um, if it happens. Well, it's, it's, it uh, will be considered by the 
procedures committee and we expect them to report uh, mm -hmm. sometime after the summer recess. Okay. Yeah. So uh, this committee for the for the the, 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 the period certainly into the early part of, of after the summer will will deal with a finance and not constitution. We can come back to the constitution issue of advice later on. But for this specific item, this is to do with the budget process. Um, Adam, did you want to speak? No. Ah. Not yet. You were waving your, thing, <laughs> your, your pencil, I just wondered. Uh, it's a good thing it's not an auction or you would have bought something by that stage. <laughs> right. Um, can I invite comments on, on the appointment of a budget advisor um, and any views that members have? Ash. I'm just thinking it might be difficult to find somebody who's an expert in both those areas and therefore maybe it might suit us better to have maybe two people. Okay. All right. If uh, such a person existed that had all the talents to cover the responsibilities, uh, then, then that might be possible. But I do agree that it may be necessary, given the additional powers that are coming to the Parliament, uh, to look at uh, two areas of expertise and look at two individuals that hold that expertise. No, two very, two very different things potentially requiring different background and experience, and I think it would make sense to look at two options if that made if that was if that was possible. I mean, as I understand it, we would have to seek probably seek additional resource, but that's not impossible to do. I think that would be better than finding ourselves constrained uh, in terms of the advice we get, particularly in what is going to be a complex year. Patrick. Happy with the approach you're suggesting. Okay, Adam. I, I was a, um, a constitutional advisor to the Hasselhoff's Constitution Committee for six years, and it was an annual appointment that was that was um, uh, was then subject to to, 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 to reappointment. Um, and I, I think in the papers it suggested that the proposed term would be two years. I, I would recommend, at least in the first instance, thinking about a one-year appointment or perhaps two one-year appointments on the basis that um, uh, you know the, the responsibilities coming to this committee are different from those that the our sister committee had in the last parliament and that we should give ourselves some wiggle room and room for manoeuvre and, lear and, and, and learn. I think that's very sound. I mean, I, I would tend to agree with that. Would members agree with that as, as an approach at this stage? Because uh, when we come to the work programme, it's obviously going to be clear that we're in a process of transition. I think, suspect, you're right that we shouldn't tie ourselves down too greatly. And the class of that's likely to affect the number of people interested in taking the job on? Uh, the space are currently putting together a list. <coughs> I mean, I, I, can't, I couldn't answer that at the moment. Mm. We already we, we already have some names on the list. Obviously, uh, we would have to we'd have to speak to them again in, in relation to that. But, but what, we'll, what, we'll, what we'll we'll do we'll do that before the next meeting when we bring mm. back the list. So we'll have that information for you then. Okay. We would seem to be minded then, firstly, to go for probably splitting this into two, and secondly, to looking at an annual appointment if. As Patrick points out, it was not a disincentive in terms of appointment. I mean, I think we, if it was, then I think we would want to reconsider that. Would that be where the committee's minded to go? Is that acceptable? Okay, uh, can we take that forward and look at the next meeting to look at a, a suggested list for two posts? Perhaps we could also start the process of seeking the resource by saying that we think it should be two posts at this stage. Um, that process we need to take forward. Okay. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. And we'll look at this in private. Sorry, Adam. I mean, um, can I just be clear that, that I mean, this doesn't preclude us um, from in the future the possibility of considering the appointment also of a, an advisor on the no. Constitution? Uh, absolutely, the, the, the it does The resource no. would stretch potentially no. to three advisors. Uh, uh, okay. If Thanks. we require that resource, then it is right that we seek that resource. Okay. Thanks. I don't think these are not items which can be skimped. So if we find ourselves in that position, but we, w we, w we won't be in a position to do that until, until the autumn, I suspect. Okay? Good. Um, the, this, uh, could I also suggest that given that we are then going to be dealing with names and appointment at the next meeting, that we take this item in private at the next meeting? I think it's impossible to do it in any other way, frankly. Okay. okay. Good. Thank you very much indeed. Um, the next item involves consideration of the legacy paper. Um, and there are two items uh, that are particularly of important. But first of all, having read the legacy paper on several occasions now, I think that we should record our, our thanks to the members of the previous Finance Committee and to its convener and vice convener for the work they undertook. This is a, a robust and informative legacy paper, and it sh should give us um, food for thought, particularly in shaping what is going to be a very busy and complex series of actions over the next few months. Um, we need to, I think, do two things today to start this process, uh, uh, an openness process up. One is 
to invite the Cabinet Secretary to give evidence to us at the next meeting to open his thoughts up to us because I think it's important that we know what he and the government are thinking about these matters. And the second one at that meeting to look at the issue of the work programme. I just want to make a couple of points before I open it up and ask Alec to, to, to contribute. Um, there is a clear role that we have to fulfil in budget scrutiny. So we are, our hands are tied to some extent about what we're going to be doing at certain times of the year. And when the budget process starts in September, then we have a clear run through and things that we have to do right through until January or early February. But in addition, for the first time, the Parliament will be considering serious matters, or first serious time, matters of taxation. And the budget scrutiny model that we are operating on is a model that is uh, predicated on spending, but not on raising money. And that creates a, a new situation which we have to consider, and which the government has to consider, both in terms of timescale and also in terms of how that scrutiny process takes, goes forward. We have a, a model that is much respected and actually has been effective uh, in terms of budget scrutiny. And I wouldn't want to lose that, but equally we will have to adapt it. So I think the first task that we have is to undertake our budget scrutiny task and to negotiate that as ever with the Scottish Government, but also to put in place, uh, along with the Government, uh, the question of how we put in a new book model. And that's going to, I think, require parallel actions to take place over the winter and into the spring. I think then there will be other issues that each of us are bringing to the table in terms of our interest in this subject and ultimately our interest in the Constitution as well, which we will want the committee to consider. But the space for us to do so in the period certainly up until January will be very limited. It will be more likely that we will have time and space thereafter, probably from the beginning of February through until next summer. And that's likely to be the annual um, I, I think, uh, a programme that we will take. We hope to have an away day uh, in August to, take, to start to take these issues forward and also to help us, and I've asked the clerks also to consider how else we can do this, to help us to come to grips with some of the very complex issues with which we will deal. I mean, those of us who were in the last parliament and who nodded sagely when the fiscal framework was going through have not necessarily engaged in the greatest detail <laughs> with the fiscal framework, which is now incumbent upon us to do. Um, so, uh, I think that we, we need to look at the budget process, we need to look at the new process of putting in place a new uh, uh, construct for scrutiny, and we will also have our own issues to bring forward. Those are all things that we need to address here. Alec. Yes, I, I look forward to an early opportunity to uh, have the Minister before us, uh, because I think uh, a close relationship between the Committee and the Minister, uh, the members of the Committee and the Minister, is uh, vital. I know that uh, the work that was done by John Swinney, uh, while we may have disagreed with him uh, to a large extent on many of the things that he did, the fact that we had that good working relationship was key to the success of the process. Uh, I also agree that, of course, with the new powers of taxation uh, coming our way, that this Committee will have to adapt uh, the way it processes the budget. Uh, it's not only taxation, my concern also extends to borrowing, but that's just me. Uh, <laughs> They, but no, but they, they, the convener also mentioned the issue of the fiscal framework and having been on the Devolution and Further Powers Committee at the time the fiscal framework was being developed, uh, it was uh, disappointing to some extent that members of this parliament and members of that committee were almost excluded from that process. Uh, so I would like, if possible, to see uh, a stronger relationship developed uh, so that we could better monitor uh, what's going on in that area. And for that reason, I think the, the constitution uh, or the constitutional element will become uh, very important to us and has an importance that will be reflected in the fiscal work of this committee, uh, not just in some separate box that is constitution. Mm -hmm. Good points. Um, who would like to, I would hope we would all contribute, Murder. Can I two issues that I've touched on in the, in the legacy paper that I think are important. The first is the role of the Scottish Fiscal Commission that has newly been established and its remit was only agreed in detail as part of the fiscal framework discussions. I think it would be important this committee has an early opportunity to meet with the Fiscal Commission members and have a full understanding from them as to how they see their role and how this committee might interact with the, with the Fiscal Commission. So I hope that could be uh, taken forward. In terms of other issues in the, in the legacy paper, there's one particular issue that's of interest 
um, having met the uh, Law Society Tax Committee just last week, I think there are issues around LBTT and its operation. And I noticed in the legacy paper at paragraph 14, there's a recommendation that uh, uh, the, the committee looks to review the first year of LBTT, uh, how it's operated, what the impact has been on the market, what the tax take has been, because the suggestion is that the tax take is below original expectations, and specifically look at the question of the uh, additional dwelling supplement, uh, which has been newly introduced, and how that's operating in practice and how uh, practitioners, uh, lawyers including, included, are having to, to deal with the practicalities of, of that particular measure. So I hope that's something the committee could consider. I think that should certainly be passed to the consideration of the work programme on the Fiscal Commission. Uh, the intention, I believe, is to have them present at the away day for an informal presentation, and I will meet the, the convener of the Fiscal Commission to have a first conversation before the end of session, and I'm obviously report on that, and we'll have a chance to meet all the members and to have that conversation. But I think it, we will require to establish a close relationship with them. Um, shall I just go on the table? Patrick? Thanks very much. Um, obviously, happy to support the proposal to have um, Derek Mackay and also the, the Commission uh, in, engage with the committee in the, the near future. Um, I, mean, I think there, there are just one or two issues that I wanted to, to pick out. Um, one is about the recommendation in the legacy paper that the committee should be leading on wider debate within Scotland about tax policy. And I, I struggle to see when we'll have a chance to do that. We're about to break for summer recess. Not very long after the summer recess, a, a draft budget will be published. Uh, it seems that there's no space for that wider debate about tax policy to take place. And um, it would be regrettable if we simply had to dinghy that aspect of the, the legacy paper. But I think it's worth noting that that's, that's going to be a, a lack. Um, I wanted to say something about the time scale of the budget process and the impact on other committees. Uh, on a number of occasions over the last session, other committees have quite justifiably complained that they're unable to make the judgments that they need to. Uh, the, the one that uh, irritated me most frequently uh, was that the carbon assessment of the budget was not produced in time for the Climate Change Committee to do its budget scrutiny. Uh, and so I think that there's a number of other examples uh, uh, around the, the remits of other committees who will be reporting to us on the budget about their specific portfolios and remits. Uh, I think we need to put pressure on the government to ensure that they have the information available for them to do their job. Uh, and I just wanted to say something as well about minority government. Um, experience tells us uh, that in a period of minority government, there can be much more substantial changes, uh, for example, to legislation uh, as it goes through. Uh, and where very substantial changes come through to legislation, it may, may well be that the financial memorandum as introduced bears very little relationship to the final article that's being passed. Uh, I noticed that the, uh, there's a, a recommendation that the government should be asked to bring forward some sort of post-stage one update on the financial memorandum. Uh, I wonder if that proposal needs to be beefed up in the context of minority government and ask the government to give an assessment of the possible changes that are under consideration by Parliament uh, in, in legislation. There might be other changes that we want to make to the budget process itself, given the context of minority government, but that's just one aspect that um, may be relevant. I think two important points. One is everything that's being was said in the discussion, the clerks will consider and, and, and refine through into the, the, the work program paper. So we're essentially laying out the ground. I think those are all important issues. Second one is you will, we will have, I hope, the Cabinet Secretary here in two weeks. Those are key issues which I think members and you particularly will want to raise one or two of those issues from the legacy paper. It's not my intention in the briefings that the committee would have to suggest questions for members. I think members should, should want to ask their own questions. But as questions occur to you, you may want to ask Spice or, or the clerks for further information to allow those questions to be filled out. But they are important questions that you're reflecting on. And the time scale you will have the chance to influence, of course, strongly, because we are talking about the new, a new budgetary model as that goes forward. I think those are very important parts. Can I ask Kate and then, and then ask James? I was just picking up a point that's already been made about um, time scales and new powers as well, and moving from just primarily scrutinising spending to also in, to including discussions on tax and you know the need to a get it right um, and b 
tax has a big impact on, on behaviour um, and making sure that our discussions are given enough time and we get enough time to scrutinise as well um, to ensure that this time in a year where there's a lot of flux and we have these new powers that we get it right and so not hurrying um, this side of Christmas. There is a protocol established it will require to be considered as we go on uh, and obviously they'll need to be you know the, com the committee will have to be happy that that is they can recommend it to the parliament I mean and that's a key issue. James. Um, I know the comments that people have made about the change in landscape and the additional tax powers and, and therefore that that's got to be a, a great focus for the committee. I think there's, there's two practical points that come out to me from the legacy paper. I think that's, first of all, the use of forecasting, um, particularly in terms of the, the Fiscal Commission. I think that can greatly help the work of the committee, uh, working along with the Budget Advisor, uh, in terms of forecasting the impact of you know, changes and also different scenarios, can help inform our discussion and also uh, you know, give a certain robustness to any decisions that we take going forward. I think the other thing that's of interest is uh, outcome-based uh, budget scrutiny. Um, I, I, I was I first sat on the Finance Committee in 2007, um, and the, there, was a, there was a lot of discussion then about outcome-based uh, budgeting, and it's probably fair to say that it's, it's something that we've not you know, we've not addressed correctly and, and got right. I think the government would, would even acknowledge that. But the, the, the point of it is that, you know, it's not just about pushing the spending into different areas, about, it's about what that spending is actually achieving. And I think it's right to focus on outcomes. And we need a framework around that so that we can properly assess the outcomes and whether the spending that's been allocated to different areas is therefore effective point and I'm sure that requires to be built into our work program both in what we do scrutinizing the budget but also as a special item thank you Ivan yeah and I would just uh, <coughs> just echo that point that James has made I mean I'm obviously on the health and sport committee as well which is the biggest spending committee and uh, that relationship between wh where the money is going and what the outcomes it's delivering are and how that aligns up with priorities and how that's measured uh, I think is very important something we should consider um, but that, that's that's all Adam? Um, th thanks. I, I, I found the legacy paper extremely helpful um, uh, and would echo the remarks that have already, already been made about it. I think that looking carefully at the role of the Scottish Fisc Fiscal Commission should be a, a priority, a short-term priority of this, of, this, of this committee. I think almost doing um, post-legislative scrutiny of the fiscal framework agreement would also be, I mean, I know it's not legislation, but in a post-agreement um, uh, um, scrutiny of that would, would, be, would be valuable. Um, um, uh, I, 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 I do have a concern about um, uh, building in enough time in this committee's very crowded agenda in the autumn um, for um, whatever the constitutional consequences are of next week's referendum. I'm sub very, very conscious of the Purdue rules, I won't say anything about the referendum, but I mean, whatever the result. Uh, on uh, Thursday, it will have constitutional consequences, not only for the United Kingdom, but also for um, Scotland. And um, we shouldn't, I think, uh, convene with respect, imagine that it would be appropriate only to start consideration of those uh, in, the, um, in the new year. I think we'll have to find time, whether we like it or not, in the autumn to take on board something of that. I think you're absolutely right about that. Uh, uh, and, and whilst we, we cannot apparently go into any detail of it, that will be an imperative. Um, and I don't think there's any question that that will require to be done. Um, it, just in terms of the way the committee operates, I'm obviously entirely in the hands of the committee, but during the discussion of committee reform in the last session, there were discussions about ways in which committees might operate either through rapporteurs, and this committee has worked through rapporteurs before, I think, has it? No? Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, it depends what you mean by rapporteurs, but... Not, not, not particularly. Okay. Not particularly. Right. Tend to work as a committee as a whole, to be honest. Either through rapporteurs or through small groups, at the, with the consent of the committee, because it is, we will be immensely pressed. I mean, this committee will meet once a week, uh, you know, and, and I really don't think that it's sensible for committees to meet twice a week. Uh, but there will be other things to be done. So I will, hopefully, the committee will be agreeable about working in slightly different ways from time to time, uh, and I think we should have developed the confidence in each other that we can allow that to happen. Okay, Neil. 
Yeah, just um, just a couple of points. Um, I would echo Murdo Fraser's point about looking at LBTTT um, and the issues there. Obviously, there's been concerns raised by the Scottish Property Federation and 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 others about the impact on on that particular um, tax, and obviously we should be monitoring that. Um, I'd agree with what's been said about you know out uh, outcome-based budget scrutiny, and also if we can look at not just outcomes but look at the impacts as well. I think that would be. Um, of, of budget decisions that would be beneficial. The other thing in terms of timescales that's came up, I was obviously note that the legacy paper says that the committee was often put under unrealistic timescales by other committees. I'm not sure in terms of financial memorandum, there's over 60 financial memorandum I think in the last term. I'm not sure if we're going to be dealing with this, the same amount of legislation this term or not, but I, do, I don't know. Obviously I've not been on the committee before, but I don't know if there's anything we can do to change that, but it might be worth discussing that. It's an important point, and with uh, with uh, um, secondary legislation too, which, given the implementation of tax powers, I suspect will be considerable. We will have to look at that. Thank you. Willie? Thanks, convener. Um, in your own remarks, you you talked about a new construct for scrutiny, and whilst I completely agree with the comments made about outcomes-based scrutiny, I think there's a case to be made for trying to put some kind of scrutiny process in at an early stage of financial planning. Um, Murdo Fraser might recall some of the experiences we both had in the Audit Committee over a number of years, where there were some common threads running through the public sector and public finances, and we always seemed to intervene or scrutinise at the end of a process. So good practice would, would tell me, and I would hope that members would agree, that if we can do any element of earlier scrutiny of some of the financial planning perhaps we might not get the opportunity to do it too much convener, and I'm not suggesting that we begin to attempt to micromanage projects or capital projects or whatever that are going on. But I think there is a job of work to be done to look at as the earlier stage as possible if financial planning is reliable enough for us. If not us, then, then who should do that kind of activity? And I hope members might support that and the committee might get an opportunity to do something in that area. Good. Thank you. Aye. Ash? No, nothing. Okay, good. Um, I think we've. Would anybody like to, 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 to make further comment? If not, I think the clerks have a clear indication of what the initial priorities are. What I would suggest is that we have. We, I think we have agreed to invite the Cabinet Secretary to come in two weeks' time. Yeah. I think we should then consider a legacy uh, a, a work program in private. Um, and which is a normal way of doing it, and it will take account of the points raised here and the legacy papers, um, and we will then be able to discuss in more detail what we might do. We will also know what uh, post-Brexit looks like, so we'll have some idea of what will fit in there. Anything else? Uh, yes, we'll take the paper in private. Is that agreed? Okay. We are now uh, at the end of the public part of the meeting, so I'm going to close this part of the meeting, allow the public and the official report to leave, and then we will move into private session for agenda item session 7.